ESPN and the Ladies Pro Bowlers Tour presents the championship round finals of the $100,000 Samstown Invitational. Qualifying in the number five position for tonight's championship round, the 1988 Samstown champion, Donna Adamek of Apple Valley, California. Her opponent in the opening match is three-time champion, Wendy McPherson of San Diego. Michelle Mullen, who earlier this year won the Lady Fairlanes Open, will start from the middle of the stack, while the 1987 Samstown Invitational champion, Debbie Bennett of Akron, Ohio, will look for her second title from the runner-up position. And after 52 games here in Las Vegas this week, eight-time champion Jeannie Maiden will need to win just one game the title match in order to collect $20,000 in first place prize money. Welcome everyone to Samstown Bowling Center and Casino located in Las Vegas, Nevada for tonight's championship round finals of the $100,000 Samstown Invitational. Hi everybody, I'm Denny Schreiner and welcome to Samstown in Las Vegas and uh, hopefully you've had enough turkey on this Thanksgiving day and evening, so settle back, enjoy yourself. We've got some outstanding players on our LPBT telecast here this evening. Working with me once again, Leila Wagner and Leila Donna Adamek has done something that's I think unprecedented in professional bowling history. She's made five consecutive championship round appearances in the same bowling center. One would think that she would be brimming with confidence heading to Las Vegas, but that wasn't the case this week. No, it wasn't. Donna has not not been bowling well lately. She came into this bowling center rather nervous, but she says, you know, I actually do bowl better when I'm feeling the, the pressure. She came out the first round. She shot over 300 over. She was able to lead the tournament for four rounds. Debbie Bennett's new home away from home may be Las Vegas. She won here in 87 when she burst onto the national scene. As a part-time player, she qualifies number two again this week. Why does she bowl so well here? Well, a lot of times the characteristics of a bowling center, particularly the carry, and that's uh, just what Debbie been and had this week that a lot of us didn't and uh, she does have the confidence here at Sandstown. All right, our top seed Jeannie Maiden averaged nearly 229 for 52 games here this week. Why did she become the number one seed? Well, Jeannie just missed the television show in Albuquerque a couple of weeks ago. This week, she says, I'm going to make it, and I'm going to hang on to that number one position. She said, you never can have too many pins, and she just got very focused. She likes to play the inside line, and uh, she just ran away with the field. All right, and throughout her career as a top seed, she has won four times and lost five times. She's looking to get back to 500, and if she does here tonight, she'll collect $20,000 in first place prize money. Coming Coming up next, our opening match from Samstown in Las Vegas, featuring the 1988 champion Don Adamek and Wendy McPherson. The LPBT on ESPN coming up next. Everyone to Samstown in Las Vegas, opening match of the Samstown Invitational, featuring the 88 champion here, Don Adamek, and her opponent, Wendy McPherson Papanos. Well, it really seems that uh, Donna comes on strong here at the end of. Uh, the seasons as she won here in 88. It was her first win in three years. Starts with an X championship round pair, 19 and 20. The ladies averaged on this pair, 216.2. Throughout the week, the scores were uh, in the high range, Leila. Easy to hit the pocket. It was just a question if you could knock them all down. It really was. I think I had eight different balls and I could hit the pocket with all eight of them, <laughs> but couldn't find one that got ten. That's why uh, I'm up here talking this week. That does tell you something. And across the house, it was fairly easy to get to the pocket as we take a look at Wendy McPherson. Wendy McPherson with that familiar five-step approach. Starts the ball on her second step. Nice push away. Medium backswing. And she comes through. Actually, low-dipped right shoulder. Wendy averaged 230 on this pair of lanes. Looked like she hung up in that shot. In a little area, though, she leaves the ringing 10. Didn't look like she got out of that very clean. Well, it appears that when you do swing the ball a little bit too far to the right, that's when you leave those ringing 10s. Uh, most of the players that were able to carry were playing as uh, direct as possible to the pocket, trying to keep the line pretty tight right around anywhere from the 9th to 12th board, uh, depending on the time of day that they bowled. Of course, a different format for the ladies this week in Las Vegas. 52 games all told, so the five players who survived to this point have to be a little physically and mentally tired. Oh, plus uh, the end of a nine-week uh, swing out here on tour. You know, 52 games. They bowled, uh, we bowled two rounds of eight games and then two rounds of six just to qualify. Then we went into uh, three sets of eight-game matches for uh, the top 24. 
looking for a good reaction, and she gets it as Donna Adamek starts quickly here with the double in match number one. Donna Adamek, uh, five foot two inches, very short, low, low push away. She's been working on this. She takes the five-step approach, uses all of the approach to gain momentum and speed. High, high backswing. Look at the knee bend, the follow-through. Her nickname throughout the years has always been Mighty Might. And with 17 career titles, that's pretty self-explanatory. Trying to open up with the first three. That one was dead right. And boy, look at the pin action. Seven pin wobbles, waits, and then hangs on. Also, the uh, carry seemed to be better when you hit very light. It seemed that uh, you didn't quite, uh, you could swish the pin, pins quite a bit more than if you hit solid in the pocket. That 10 pin was just really difficult to get out this week. Bowling on synthetics here at Samstown this week. Well, we talked about all of the games that you have to bowl to get to, to the final five. And, of course, uh, after the sixth round, before the final round of match play, Donna went out and practiced at another bowling center because she didn't feel like her timing was very good. Well, Donna led this tournament uh, for the first five rounds uh, virtually uh, 200 pins ahead of uh, the second place position. And she came out uh, the first night of finals and really did not bowl well. And uh, the next morning, she did not bowl well either. And she said, you know, i got to figure this out. And she did go down the street and practice. Timing was a little bit off uh, as she leads by nine. However, Wendy McPherson with a double here could uh, take the lead for the first time in this one by a single stick. And Michelle Mullen has qualified number three, Debbie Bennett number two. And of course, Jeannie Maiden averaging nearly 230 this week is our top seed in Las Vegas. Nice roll, a double for Wendy McPherson, who takes the lead here after four frames at Samstown in Las Vegas. We'll be back with more of match number one. We've got a good one between Wendy McPherson and the 1988 champion here in Las Vegas, Donna Adamack. Come back to Las Vegas. Let's get this out early. Uh, did you do well this week on the tables? Actually, uh, since I had Ryan with me, I didn't uh, have much opportunity to play at all, so Marty okay. said I could bring him with me from now on to Fine. Vegas. That makes sense. Uh, <gasps> cheaper to send him out here exactly. than to have you play for four or five days. Adamick comes back with a strike of her own in the fourth, and uh, the television pair set up this week, uh, as I think the lanes were throughout the week, uh, pretty easy to hit the pocket, just a question of whether or not you can carry. Here you can see, uh, actually, uh, Donna's break point more around the 33rd uh, foot line, right? Eighth board. So uh, she's crossing from the 12th to about the eighth board. So about a four board belly for Donna Adamek at this stage. It looks like Wendy may be swinging in a touch more than that. Oh, as I mentioned, the solid tens. Uh, <laughs> Boom, she left an eight pin. Yep, and you have to scratch your head when you throw a quality shot like that and come up with a nine count. Watch the head pin there. It gets just between the ball and the five pin. Mm -hmm. to shoot straight back. And shooting the eight, all you do is throw your strike shot, right? <laughs> Normally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> In Donna's case, no. <laughs> she threw her strike shot. She Supposed to knock it. it down the first time. Exactly. Wendy McPherson working on a double, leading by one, could extend the lead here in our opening match. The ninth and final week of the LPBT Fall Tour on ESPN. A little more long. And there's the light hit that you were talking about. And this is uh, Wendy's fifth frame here, as you can see where she's playing. Basically the same area, except uh, she's a little bit deeper in the head, the very front part of the lane, and uh, her ball speed's just a little bit slower. And in relation to Donna, about a six board belly uh, from the heads to out there at about 35 feet, so about two boards difference in the way these two are playing the championship round pair. Oh my, I didn't think there was any way that would come back, so. McPherson has strung together four consecutive strikes and has opened up a 21-pin advantage. Wendy really looking uh, to try to win a match on television as uh, she is 0-5. Conversely, you look at the other side of the spectrum, Donna Adamek has always been a very fine championship round player. 
Not that Wendy isn't, but uh, she went through a stretch where she won everything on television. Now it's kind of flopped in the other direction for her. Donna really making a comeback after taking a few years off in the mid-80s. She was a four-time bowler of the year from 1978 to 1981. Took a few years off and uh, really came back strong in 1988 with that first win after three years. Let me ask you this, Leal, as uh, Don Adamick re-racks for the first time on 19. When you sense your opponent has a great shot, does it put more pressure on you when you fall behind early? Oh, definitely. Uh, if your player's up there, or your opponent is up there striking on you, uh, and you only have a few frames and you don't quite feel lined up yet, there's a lot more added pressure. Well, she dropped that right at the foul line, and I was going to say, if she struck on that shot, she would have been very fortunate. To got out of the ball a little bit early after the re-rack, so still a 21-pin lead for Wendy McPherson. Not quite getting the lift on the ball uh, because she dropped it, so the fingers were not able to turn the ball and rotate it as much, and uh, basically left the week 10. Coming back this fall after laying off quite some time with a leg and back injury, a lower back injury, and... Donna said she was surprised. She had worked pretty hard. She felt like she was going to bowl better this fall than she really did, although the last couple of weeks she started to turn things around. Wendy McPherson leads by 21. We'll come back with the conclusion of match number one from Las Vegas after these messages. And frame, because Wendy McPherson has also opted for a re-rack. She's working on a four-bagger. Well, I think Donna re-racked on lane 19 because she knew she threw such a great shot and left that uh, solid eight pin. Uh, she wasn't going to take any other chances. <laughs> well, I tell you, that's very, very tough on you mentally. Throw a great shot. Wendy McPherson a little high in the pocket on lane 20, and she leaves the solid four, so Donna's probably breathing a sigh of relief, realizing she still has a chance. That ball uh, appearing to be a little bit deeper, uh, cut in a little hard. She really just let up on her ball speed a little bit, and... Uh, caused her to leave a four pin. For Wendy, I asked her, did you feel like you had to keep your speed up this week or actually throw it a little softer for Carrie? And she said for her, she needed to keep her speed up. It's been a sensational fall for Wendy McPherson. She hasn't won a tournament as her dad looks on, but she's had a consistent fall from week to week. She's had a number of chances to win. Of course, she was the top seed in Rockford, but she was defeated there by Lori Nichols. So all told, it's been a very outstanding fall tour for her. Wendy went through a slump there where she was not bowling well on tour and uh, or consistent and like you said she just put it all together this fall and uh, things have really turned around for her. Her father Chris McPherson uh, in the audience again this week has really just put a lot of work in into her game and a lot of support. Comes back with a beautiful strike in the eighth so it's a 20-pin lead. However, Donna Adamek still has some room. She could shoot 239. Take a look at uh, where Wendy's playing. Now she sets the ball in around the 15th board, and it is belling out closer to the 10th to 12th board before making the break back. Back to live action. Donna Adamek needs to get something started, and she gets a major break. Trips out the 4 and the 7. Well, you don't lead a tournament uh, for five rounds without some carry, and uh, what goes around comes around. She says, hey, I left that solid eight. I, I deserve a break. Well, what she's saying now is if I can strike in the foundation frame here in the ninth, I can put a little bit of heat on Wendy McPherson. Wendy could still shoot 259 as opposed to 239 for Donna Adamek. Break leaves the half 10 on the left-hand lane, lane 19, a lane that she said hooked a couple more boards for her than did number 20. Well, if it did hook a few more boards for her, she could be just in a little bit deeper because she knows it's going to hook up high, so she's uh, definitely made the adjustment for 19 hooking too much. All you have to do is look back in this match to the solid eight that she left in the fifth. If she strikes there, she would have then ended up with a turkey in the sixth. Would have been a much closer match as we head into the home stretch. The match would have been virtually even mm -hmm. if she would have carried that eight pin in the fifth. Sometimes it's just not meant to be. Of course, we've already mentioned uh, Don Adamick with five consecutive appearances in the championship round in the same bowling center. That's a phenomenal record. We don't want to forget uh, her and Michelle Mullen just two years ago led the doubles tournament here uh, as well. So for Donna, the last six times she has bowled in this house, she has made the telecast. 
a double up and uh, Wendy McPherson in the process right now of uh, winning match number one here in Las Vegas. And uh, as Leila already mentioned, she's 0-5 on the year, so anything right now is a moral victory. Oh, Wendy has to feel uh, very, very uh, good about winning this match and also bowling a, a, a good game. As uh, Unfortunately, some of her appearances of late have not been uh, to her caliber of player. I think she was very disappointed in Rockford. She bowled just tremendously. Remember that last day? Oh. She averaged nearly 250 for the last 16 games and uh, got on the telecast and got locked up a little bit. Lanes had changed on her, and she just didn't bowl a very good game. That's the most difficult part about it, Denny, is to lead a tournament like that by so many pins. As uh, we see Jeannie Maiden, you know, coming in today, leading this event th by over 300 pins, and things change in a day overnight. And uh, we've often talked about the format being probably not too fair for especially the top speed players mm -hmm. but it's great for television a win for wendy mcpherson who is trying to finish 1990 on a very high note as i mentioned a consistent fall overall in the year she's 10th in money sixth in average ninth in points so she's been kind of hanging around most of 1990 but still looking to win her first title since the 1988 queens Solid performance, a game of 237, and obviously Dad agrees. A very, very happy Chris McPherson, as he always <laughs> felt he was a uh, bad luck charm for uh, Wendy every time uh, she made a show. Donna with two good friends, uh, Randy and Brent, at home in Apple Valley, California. Matter of fact, Randy is here, a very avid supporter. She wanted to let them know she's always thinking about them out here on the road. I was chatting with Donna just prior to the telecast. She said, well, the first thing I'm going to do, win or lose here, is go home and get into the gym and start working out physically. I'm not in the kind of shape that I want to be in physically to compete out here, so that's my first order of business. Well, it's very important. I bowled with a couple amateurs this week, and one of them said to me, aren't you tired after this many games? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's uh, one thing that folks at home don't understand, that this game is very, very physical, and it takes a lot of training. Most of these women out here do work out in the gym. Uh, on their time off and also on the time on the road. Mm -hmm. We get a few passes and head out to a local uh, spa while we're in town. Well, it never fails. You always strike out when it doesn't mean anything. A fifth place finish for Donna Adamick. Wendy McPherson moves on after a 237-219 victory. Next opponent, Michelle Mullen of Matson, Illinois. Everybody knows they have the largest computer show here in Las Vegas every year, but that's not what we're looking at right now. This is Boulder Track, provided to us by the good folks at Brunswick. Nick Papanos, uh, that's Wendy's husband, up here trying to chart the Boulder Track system. And of course, to his right, Judy Sutarn. It was a big week for Judy this week in Vegas. It sure was, Denny. Uh, it marked the retirement uh, for Judy Sutar after 30 years on tour. Here she is at uh, age 13 started very young and here she is in 1960 when she was a member of the Brunswick advisory staff and uh, the 1975 photo bowler of the year Judy was a two-time bowler of the year also bowler of the year 1973 and this was a tribute in People magazine to both her and her husband Dave and uh, we want to wish Judy well we threw a great party for her Monday night and uh, surprised her and uh, we want to wish her well in the future. Well, truly one of the great pioneers of women's professional bowling, uh, a player that's given a lot of her own time and energy to promote the game of bowling for the ladies and for the men as well. And uh, she's mentioned that she's still going to bowl the big tournaments and the Brunswick events, so it's not like she won't be competing at all, but it's time to cut back a little on the schedule. Wendy McPherson now starts match number two. Michelle Mullen wasted no time whatsoever in walking up and striking and let Wendy know right off the bat, hey, I got a good shot too. Well, Michelle uh, Mullen uh, really making her big debut earlier this year in the Fairlanes uh, tournament in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It's, uh, she came out as the top seed and won that event. A little hold shot for Wendy McPherson who raises the eyebrows. That was Tug City that time. She did not throw that one where she wanted to. This ball going right from the 15th board early on in the front part of the lane, only out to about the 10th board, so she definitely did not swing this as far as she had been. Uh, the good ball speed kept the ball on line, and uh, she said that was a key for her. As you can see here, the bowler track system giving you the rundown, and she threw that at about 16 and a half miles an hour. 
Left lane hooks a little bit more, and, uh, well, she couldn't tug it that time. Ends up with a Brooklyn. When you got the hot hand, everything goes well. Well, here, let's take a look exactly what happened here. As you can see, she uh, only was at the 11th board, and so she definitely tugged it, especially if lane 19 is hooking more than lane 20. And she's dancing them down. Hey, if they're going to cross over, you're going to hope for the best. <laughs> Brooklyn strike. Uh, Michelle Mullen tries lane 20 for the first time and throws a... Perfect shot, leaves a ringing 10-pin. Beautiful shot there. As I saw so many 10-pins throughout the week left by all players. <laughs> Nothing new, and it was really a trick to try to get them out. You know, the good news was you could hit the pocket across the bowling center. The bad news was you kept leaving the corner pins. Michelle switching to a harder surface uh, bowling ball, lower friction. And uh, look at Michelle's game. Now, she uses the five-step approach as well, all of the lane, all of the approach. Pretty high backswing. Look at her cupped wrist. She stays very much under the ball. When she comes through it, she has a very nice high roll. Talented collegiate player. Had a terrific career and uh, has now come out on the national tour and won her first title. This time trips out the four pin. The nine nearly had some company. Michelle also recently signing on with the Ebonite staff of champions. So uh, it's been a big week for her. Kind of a funny fall tour. Started off okay and then went into a small slump. We'll stick at the line, but... Uh, comes up with the spare Bill Supper, Vice President of Sales for Ebonite, uh, is on hand here this week and has been out the last two or three weeks, and they've been working a little on Michelle's physical game, uh, keeping her shoulders back a little bit. There's a good look at Bill, uh, one of the outstanding supporters of uh, not only the Ladies Pro Bowlers Tour, but the Seniors Tour and the PBA National Tour. Pretty good bowler in his own right. Well, he said he had been working with uh, Michelle in Houston. He said when she runs into problems, it's usually because her uh, shoulders are too far forward. Mm -hmm. No problem right now for Wendy McPherson, who chatted with Dad after the opening game victory over Donna Adamick. Wendy probably just went over to Dad and said, look, I told you you were not a bad luck charm. Now just sit back, relax, right. and I've got everything under control. I'll take care of the rest of this. <laughs> Uh, I think it's so marvelous for a parent to get a chance to go out and watch their son or daughter compete on the national level. It's got, it's got to be such a thrill. It's got to be really tough to watch this. It's very difficult. My parents were here this week. <laughs> All right, 31-pin lead for Wendy McPherson, who was perfect through four frames here in Las Vegas. McPherson started with the first four. Michelle trailing by 31 here in game number two. Michelle, a bowling instructor during uh, the off season in her hometown of Madison, Illinois. Mm, and after the break, perhaps the speed slowed down just a little bit through the nose and disaster strikes for Michelle Mullen in the fourth. A lot of times though, when you sit there with the break, try to get the same feel again and exactly what you said, that speed just lets up just a little bit. And uh, that's exactly what happened throughout the week when you did let up on the speed. Michelle, that time th throwing the ball right around uh, 16 miles per hour. I have not uh, noticed exactly what her mm -hmm. speed has been uh, in the previous few frames, so we'll have to take a look later on in the match. Now in an unenviable position of trailing by 45, trailing to a player that's doing nothing but hitting the pocket. Better speed on this shot. Nice reaction and X. The question now is, does she still have time to apply any pressure on Wendy McPherson? Well, she does. There's, it's never too late. As uh, being down by 45 pins, anything can happen with half a game left. But uh, Wendy looks pretty locked in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 300 games this week, Wendy was one of them. Also, Mary Martha's... Trinilia and Jackie Sellers were all awarded $300 in cash by the nice folks here at Samstown. Not to be here, though, in the second game of the championship round finals. Uh, an uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically uh, errant shot here for Wendy. This was not a good shot. No, really, this ball not crossing out far enough again. Uh, 
unlike the one that actually held the line for her, she was in deep around the 14th board and uh, ball only making it back out to about the 10th. And now she takes the three off the 10, so this match tightens up considerably. Michelle Mullen, who was working on a strike, could close the gap as uh, Wendy's dad checks out the electronic scoring. It's really the first unforced error that we have seen from Wendy. She did throw one Brooklyn shot. And got away with it, mm -hmm. made a, a, turned a double into a four bagger. Much more room with this shot. Trusted it a little bit on the left hand lane. So she strikes in the sixth, but now it's a 31 pin match. If Michelle throws a couple of strikes, this one will be with an 11 pins. That ball's really just swinging out quite a bit more. Uh, she needs to trust it out to the right a little bit farther. Well, we haven't seen any washouts or anything of that variety, so obviously it's going to hook back. A little more speed this time for Michelle. Needs the light hit break, and she doesn't get it as she leaves the five pin. There was quite a bit of out-of-bounds area um, during the week. Denny threw some of the pairs in the house. This particular pair, 19 and 20, is on the lower end of the house. These pairs had the characteristic of being tighter. Uh, the higher end uh, did hook earlier, and also there was more back end, so the players were playing lanes a little bit deeper on the high end. Of course, basically, we're near the middle of the house as you take a look at uh, the triumvirate represented here at Samstown. Bob Newman and Mr. Frazier will be passing out uh, uh, the trophy the jacket and the check when this one's all over. $20,000 to our winner here this evening. Some great folks here at Samstown have uh, been with us and avid supporters over the years. Does not look as if Michelle is getting out of the ball the way she would like to. As this time she leaves the 2-5. Michelle appears to be just a little bit nervous. A lot riding on the line for her this evening. If she were to finish in the first place position, she would win herself a trip to the Cambridge uh, Doubles, which is an invitational event for the top 24 men pros and top 24 women pros in December. And we'll develop that story further when we come back here to Samstown in Las Vegas. Wendy McPherson leads by 33. She's on a strike, and she's thinking about another win. A strike, and now in the seventh frame. See if she comes back on this right lane after her 310. Gave that ball ball quite a bit more room you could just see it also better ball speed and uh, that ball was flush in the pocket i just wonder if she was aware of the fact that she might have been tightening the line up a little bit sometimes i guess you're not huh well you have to be able to feel it i'm sure you sure she does uh know that that's what she was doing it's just a matter of uh knowing what you're doing and knowing what you want to do mm -hmm. <laughs> and once again here's exactly how she did tighten it up uh 15th to about 10, but with better ball speed. This one high and through the nose, and the second split here in the second game after she missed the baby split in the fifth. Now the 4 6 7 jumps up, so Michelle Mullen is still alive. Well, 19 definitely appeared that it was uh, breaking more. Also, later on in the lane, watch uh, just the last five feet, that ball takes a left turn. Left-hand lane, I think, obviously, you know, hook a couple more boards than the right, and they may even be breaking down faster. Difficult for us to tell. Now for Michelle Mullen, she still is uh, in a position where she could uh, pull this one out, but she's going to have to start striking right now in the eighth frame. Still has a possible 2-13 game if she can get something started, and this time the half-10, and Michelle is uh, just not throwing the ball as crisp and as clean as she did last night. Doesn't appear that she's getting quite the rotation on the ball that she did uh, earlier in the week. Really not ripping through it. Uh, a little bit more apprehensive when she comes through it. A, a tremendously talented physical player who I think is still uh, developing, uh, learning uh, the mental side of things. And I think even uh, learning more about herself out here on the national tour. It's a whole different situation when you're out working on your own and having to travel every week and, and face the, the trials and tribulations of the national tour. Well, after coming off a of one win, you always want to win that second title to prove that you're just not uh, a one-time winner. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say that there's a lot of pressure to win the first one, but I think there's a lot of pressure to win the second one as well. 
Well, a spare here and three strikes in the tenth would give her 191. It's going to force Wendy McPherson to show up in the ninth and the tenth, but not much more than that. Well, you know, it's kind of your night, too, when you you get breaks like that from your opponent where uh, they don't go out and, and shoot a big game against you. That's probably what's going through Wendy's mind. Well, Wendy with opening up with the first four and also catching the double put the pressure on Michelle right away. And uh, that makes for a lot tighter arm swing. Spare here will just about do it. Any kind of count whatsoever in the 10th frame will make Wendy McPherson a winner. So that uh, does change the scenario for the Cambridge. It sure does. Uh, with Mullen losing, uh, Mary Martha Trinilia has just moved into the 24th spot, and Karen Ellingsworth is now the alternate for the second year in a row for the <laughs> Cambridge Doubles. Well, the uh, good news there is at least uh, you get a chance to go to the event itself and uh, you get uh, a nice paycheck. However, if everybody plays, you basically watch all week long, which can't be a lot of fun. We had Karen uh, jumping around a couple times last year, almost <laughs> going in uh, for uh, myself as well as Anne Marie. And there were a few of us out there that uh, weren't sure we were going to make it through. Well, it's really a lot of fun, I guess, as the girls start watching the top 24 list the last three or four weeks to find out who will qualify and who will won't. Wendy McPherson now moves on to match number three, and she appears to be the player right now that's uh, going to be vying for the title. Of course, Debbie Bennett of Akron, Ohio, will try and have something to say about that in the semifinal game. Debbie Bennett not having to work as hard as she did uh, just a couple years ago as she qualified for the first match and uh, worked her way up through the whole field, qualifying second this year. She only has to win two matches. Realizes it's easier to win this thing the higher up you qualify. Wendy McPherson now loosens up the arm swing and uh, with a strike here would shoot a game of 221 to go along with the 237 she opened with. Seems like this fall, Leila, it's been a situation where we've had a player that's qualified fourth or fifth that's won the first couple of games it's just continued to climb the ladder and uh, provide all the excitement exactly we saw Nikki Giannullius do it earlier also Leanne Barrett mm -hmm. uh, it seems that, that that is the thing this fall but it doesn't happen very often no it does not as a matter of fact I think Nikki qualifying number five is the only player in 1990 to win all four matches from the number five slot. Leanne qualified number four, but you still have to win the four games. Exactly. And for Michelle Mullen, uh, a big week here in Las Vegas, but uh, it's not going to end up the way that she would have liked. disappointing uh, game for Michelle after bowling so well throughout the week. Well, when you average 224.2 for 52 games and you come out on national television and shoot 170-something, uh, not exactly what you're looking for. But she'll go watch the tape, find out what she did well, what she didn't, make the adjustments, and the next time she gets to the championship round, maybe she'll end up in the winner's circle. We've come to the end of our second game, 220-179, to 179, a victory for Wendy McPherson. Now next in line, it's a part-time pro from Akron, Ohio, Debbie Bennett, who won here back in 1987. I want to thank you personally for uh, the turkey and the dressing that you provided and the pumpkin pie. Anytime was I can cook for you, just let me know. And of course, maybe next year for Thanksgiving, Marty can come out and enjoy some of the That's festivities right. here in Las Sam's Vegas. Down? Okay, we'll take a look now at other finishers here on this Thanksgiving evening. Robin Romeo, who's had a terrific record here, just missing by 27 pins. Nikki G has been perhaps the best player this fall. She finishes number seven. Jill Albright, first time in the finals in a while, finishing in 15th. Vesma with a nice finish in the number 14 position. Lori Nichols, who bounced back this fall, uh, ends up in the number 16 position. Stacy Ryder winning the doubles just last week. All right, as we look down at some of the other finishers here in Las Vegas this week, plenty of paychecks to be had at Samstown. Tori Romeo, 26th. Uh, Debbie Renone and Kathy McNaughton tying for 28th. And Lori Evans finishing up in 35th. Dinah Wheeler in the number 36 position. Uh, oh, Jerry Edwards and Jeannie Berry who won the doubles here a while back, uh, tying for 43rd. Pat Rossler, Team USA coach. And last but seventh. not least, Angela Barraconi, 
stealing that last check here in Las Vegas worth $585. You know, she did that in Delaware, too. She got that last check and uh, took it away from me. Just tell her, <laughs> and the last shall be first. One of these days, uh, it will happen for Angela. Yeah, interesting evening when she wins out here, don't you think? Be a when big they, party. Yeah, I was going to say that it would be fun for one and all on the LPBT tour. Um, as Wendy McPherson opens up with the 245, quite a party for uh, Judy Sutar here this week. Huh? Oh, wonderful party on Monday night. All the players attended, brought in all her family. Wendy, I think, making a little bit of adjustment now in lane 19 as she has gone high. Last couple times, looking not to chop the bucket, a big smile, because it was like a whoo, little sigh of the brow. Mm -hmm. Time to get the old body English out, nearly chopped off and left just the five. Yes, the two and the four almost uh, went without the five. Hard, Saved the paint. Hard to believe the five pin fell. Debbie Bennett, vivid memories of 1987, when she won four consecutive matches, comes out loses the first shot. Player that goes very direct at the pins. She does not hook the ball much, does not uh, cross very many boards, has been playing very straight. Normally throughout the week, much farther inside. She dropped that ball. This is the out of bounds area that I talked about earlier. On seventh, eighth board, that ball will not come back if you send it out there. Trying for the one, two, eight. And a pause just to look, but no problem. Debbie thought she wouldn't be quite as uh, nervous this week, but uh, she says, you know, I really still am. Four-step approach, very basic game. Actually, her wrist appears to be a little bit broken in her backswing, so she does not really get the rotation and the turn on the ball that uh, you might see a lot of the touring players get. But she is extremely accurate, and she has been able to carry those light wall shots all week. And after throwing the opening shot, you know you're going to kind of help and tug the second one through the nose, fortunate to leave just the six pin. Debbie, one of the better players when they're a lot drier. Told me that uh, the difference between the lanes here in 90 and 87, uh, actually quite a bit easier to score on. She said the conditions were much more difficult when I was lucky enough to win in 87. However, I did have a lot of confidence coming in here and thought if I could get things going, I might make a run. All she did was shoot 802 for the first three games last night, so she saved the best for last. She wanted to uh, assure herself of a spot here in the television final. That's one way to do it. <laughs> one pin match. Keep in mind, the winner takes on our top seed, Jeannie Maiden, for $20,000 in first place prize money. Excellent shot for Wendy McPherson. And she strikes on lane 20. Wendy McPherson really able to catch, uh, catch some of the big titles as she won the 1986 U.S. Open as a rookie or an amateur. And uh, she has also captured the WIBC Queens title. So uh, Samstown would just put the icing on the cake for uh, major championships. Obviously likes this pair, huh? Eight strikes on each lane. It almost appeared that 19 was not uh, favorable for her, but... According to the stats, she's hit them both the same. Six pin worked overtime on that shot on 19 as it slapped out the 10, and she doubles in the second and the third. Uh, quite a bit tighter uh, on lane 19 as she's playing the 15th board to about the 11th. A uh, lot of ball speed that time, though. 17 miles an hour. And Debbie much farther to the right on the 10th board going towards the 13th board. So Debbie is pointing the ball up to the pocket, whereas Wendy's swinging the ball away from the pocket. Excellent comeback shot on lane 20 for Debbie Bennett, who, with a double here, I think would probably relax just a little bit. I think this is the key shot of the week for her. Very, very tight. She looks uh, real tense. You know her. She's from your area. Mm -hmm. Akron, Akron, Ohio. Outstanding player. She's been able to capture one uh, Midwest regional title in 89. Pretty good shot, comes up a little high, and she leaves the 4-7, but I think she has a little better feel now for the pair. That ball breaking uh, pretty high. The fast eight, we say, is the two-pin actually just blows right up and over the four and the seven. 
had a lot of fun back in 87. I also host a Dapper Dan dinner, uh, which honors local athletes every year in Akron, and uh, she was uh, the man or the woman of the year in 1987 after she won. And had a lot of fun at the dinner that night. She's a very popular player in my hometown of Akron, Ohio, and uh, a delightful lady besides. Okay, she trails by 11. It'll have to be a come-from-behind win. Wendy McPherson has already won twice. Will it be three? Only time will tell. Boy, she always was, and she could strike as well, couldn't she? From uh, Las Vegas, hometown here, Laverne Carter. WIBC Hall of Famer. Had a nice chat with her just prior to the telecast. Uh, enjoying watching the ladies' action here this week. Wendy McPherson on a double, and she leads by 11. I think she senses a couple more strikes here. May put her in the driver's seat. Wendy's television average for this year has only been 180. Looking at, to try to better that average, and she just rips. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. What has she done? Gone to the Bob Hanley School of Striking? That ball had to be about three boards right of where she wanted it. I think it was. If you take a look at the smug smile yeah. on her face, it was like, whoa, I sent that one out. But you know, when you get a lot of extra lift, fingers on it, and uh, you can see there, all the way out to the seventh mm -hmm. board. And I think she just made me a liar because I, I said, if you threw it out there, that was out of bounds. You weren't going to get it back. Unless, of course, you're Wendy McPherson, right. then you're going to get it back. I'm just glad my eyes weren't deceiving me. Uh, she comes back with a clutch double and has applied all sorts of pressure here on Debbie Bennett, who is going to have to get started quickly or settle for third place money in Las Vegas. Debbie Bennett, one of the players out here on the tour that has a real job. <laughs> she's a UPS delivery driver, believe it or not. Uh, as petite as she is, she's out hauling those packages. And she says, well, I've had trouble striking in the 1-3 pocket. Let's try the 1-2 and see what happens. She'll take the strike. A double here would do her a world of good. Actually, just pulling that ball over. Now, when you play that... Uh, type of an angle to the pocket, trying to get the ball up to the pocket. It's very easy to pull the ball. Doesn't look as if the arm swing has loosened up at all right now. If she strikes right here, it'll be an interesting match. Got to get something started. Much oh better shot. Nice, nice shot there. Excellent shot, and she leaves the solid 10. And remember I mentioned sometimes your opponents make good shots and they don't strike and it just gives you so much more confidence. It appears as if that's the kind of night it is for Wendy McPherson. She's dodging a lot of bullets. That would have been a key double there. Put, get her back in the game at all. And uh, that ringing 10. No problem. Cross lane with the 10. Now Debbie Bennett finds herself trailing by 31, and Helen Duvall didn't trail by 31 too many times in her career, did she? No, she did not. Still a member of the AMF staff of champions. Helen Duvall is the only lifetime member out here on the Ladies Pro Bowlers Tour. And if the truth be known, she'd probably shoo it up right now and bowl with anybody out there. You bet. Especially for 20000 right? She usually does bowl in this event. I'll have to ask her after the telecast why she didn't participate this year. Probably wanted to let the kids win a little money this year. Wendy McPherson is now in the groove zone. She's just doing nothing but throwing strikes. Leads by 41, and uh, this could be a runaway here in the semifinal. What's probably going through Wendy's head right now is, hey, I was top seed. I couldn't win the event, so I'll just start from the lower positions and try my way. Well, I don't think people also realize how difficult it is emotionally to win more than one or two matches in the championship round because there's a lot of pressure involved. Your adrenaline starts pumping. It goes up and it goes down. You have high points and low points, and it's tough to kind of keep that consistent even keel through four matches. Solid 10 on the left-hand lane. She leads by 40. Debbie Bennett isn't out of the woods completely, but she'll have to start striking in the seventh. Wendy McPherson is doing what you have to do, not giving any openings whatsoever. She leads by 40. Will she move on to the championship game? Come back and find out here at Samstown in Las Vegas. Look, believe it or not, we actually do have an opportunity to sit up a little higher and uh, watch where the players are playing the lanes. 
Debbie Bennett needs to start striking right now. And it doesn't happen. A little high. Bold a fairly good game with the exception of the opening shot, but uh, has not been able to carry. That's the key. Also, when your opponent has uh, five in a row <laughs> on you, I think your uh, hand squeezes the ball just a little bit more, and all of a sudden that nice loose arm swing and your carry goes right down the tubes. Uh, the one thing that's interesting about Debbie Bennett, she is a terrific player, excellent competitor, loves to bowl, but she did mention she has a very good job in Akron, and she also has a fiancé, and she'll be getting married on September 14th, so there's a lot more to life than just knocking down 10 pins. Debbie also wanted me to mention her father, John Heater, who has been uh, her coach throughout all her bowling years. She said she's been bowling 25 years, so she started at the young age of six, and uh, said, my father made my game, and uh, I owe him everything when it comes to bowling. Debbie, of course, still competes in one of the outstanding women's leagues in the greater Akron area on Wednesday nights at Stonehenge Place. Bowling center owned by Team USA head coach Fred Borden and Mick Cirillo. Wendy McPherson in control, ahead by 41, and... Uh, thinking this could be my lucky week in Las Vegas. That's why we all end up here so many times every year, because you know it's your lucky week. You're waiting for that luck That's right. to strike. The big run. <laughs> <laughs> I have to laugh uh, during the break. Uh, Nick, uh, Wendy's husband, leaned over to me and said, we can pay, now pay the registration on the motor home. <laughs> so uh, another couple that travels uh, the course, motor home scene. They'll be purchasing a new motor home if she wins the next game after this one. It's amazing how the goals continue to rise as she does as well. No, now they'll be able to pay for gas. Right. Yeah, I was just going to say, <laughs> by 41, uh, still room to shoot 269. I don't care how good a player you are, when your opponent shoots in the 260s, you're going to make an early exit. Through the years, this tournament has been so well received. Excellent crowds all week long. Very knowledgeable bowling fans here in Las Vegas. And for Debbie Bennett, well, memories of 87. When she thinks about 1990, it'll be, that was the one that got away. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll see Debbie Bennett back here again next year, as well as uh, in the major tournaments, the U.S. Open mm -hmm. and two other events. As she's gaining seniority with her job, I'm sure she'll have a few more weeks and a look at John Ranella, Debbie's uh, fiance. So all those uh, male viewers out here that uh, that's right were just eyeing Debbie so Bennett. So much for that one. <laughs> Let's move on to another one. <laughs> very attractive and like you mentioned very delightful young lady. Oh yeah we've had a lot of fun. She bowls every year in our snowball zoo fundraiser. The what? <laughs> Our Snowball Zoo fundraiser for the Akron Zoological Park. I do a fundraiser every year. We raise, uh, well, we raised $40,000 one day last year, and we've got a big raffle. I, I'll have some raffle tickets for you, by the way, to be, to be buying here. Uh, but we're gonna looking for more than that this year, and uh, she comes out every year, and it's a celebrity pro-am. Wonderful. Yeah, she has a good time. A lot of uh, charity events mm. uh, in your home area. Well, I'll tell you the thing that's amazing. I don't think bowling gets nearly enough credit for uh, the charitable work that the industry does. Uh, every year, bowling raises millions of dollars for hundreds of different charities from coast to coast, and most people are, are unaware of it, other than the people that are in those specific areas. And I think we need to pat ourselves on the back once in a while. We do quite a bit. Debbie Bennett's third year as a part-time member, mm -hmm. 31000 Hey, you know, if you're going to take a week's she's vacation, <laughs> you might as well go out and make a few dollars. She's probably <laughs> averaging about 5000 a week when she does come. And I've talked to her. I said, you know, didn't you ever want to come out and bowl full-time? And she said, there was a time in my life when I would have liked to have done that. But, you know, for me, it's great. I compete at home. I enjoy it. I get a chance to gear up and bowl in a few national tournaments every year. That's enough for me. Debbie. It's a game of 228 as she finished with the last five as we were chatting right along there, but uh, just not going to be enough to beat Wendy McPherson. This is called stay behind the line, make any kind of a shot, and get seven, which is exactly <laughs> what she needed to win. Lucky seven here in Las Vegas. Looked up at the board yeah. again and said, well, was seven <laughs> enough? Uh, actually, she was going, uh, I thought she was going to break her uh, career high game on television, which was 265. Had mm -hmm. she struck out, she would have shut 
269. Could be saving that. <laughs> Very confident player indeed right now. And of course, keep in mind, Jeannie Maiden, who is uh, also basically from my neck of the woods up there in the Cleveland area, although now she's relocated out to Tacoma, Washington. Uh, she's been watching Wendy and realizing that she's done nothing but strike. What's going through her mind right now, Leon? Well, she knows she's going to have to come out here and uh, be very tough early, and she gets six balls to practice so with, and um, she needs to find the line quickly because it appears Wendy's uh, got it. Congratulatory handshake from Debbie Bennett. Wendy McPherson with a 241-228 victory, her third consecutive win. Now she'll take on the top seed, a lady that averaged nearly 230 for 52 games this week, Jeannie May. View what's happened here at Samstown in Las Vegas. It's pretty much been all Wendy McPherson who threw seven strikes in game number one and defeated Donna Adamek 237 to 219. And then it was on to match number two for Wendy McPherson. Michelle Mullen struggled a little bit uh, in game number two. She had only 179, Leila. But Wendy opened up with the first four strikes, but was able to put that pressure on Michelle early. And ended up with eight X's in game number two, 220 to 179. On to the semifinal game against the 1987 Samstown winner, Debbie Bennett, who got off to a slow start. And conversely, the five-bagger for Wendy was the difference in that game. If uh, Debbie could have got anything started early, she might have been in the match. So 241 to 228, Wendy McPherson averaging 232 for the first three victories. A game of 232 might win her the Samstown title. But uh, before we get to the championship game where she will face Jeannie Maiden, this is our last good chance to take a look at who will be the bowler of the year in 1990. Leanne Barrett, I, I guess, has got to be the front runner at this stage, although Leanne and Tish, neither one of them cashed in Las Vegas this week. No, they didn't, but uh, because the two of them both have three titles, uh, in average, uh, Leanne is number one, also number one in earnings, but earnings is not over because the Cambridge Mixed Doubles does count in the LBBT earnings list. And Tish Johnson won that event a year ago, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it's an extra $15,000, so she still could move past Leanne, but uh, let's take a look at some of the other stats. The money right there, should Leanne win, she would eclipse the $100,000 mark for the season, and uh, there you see, in uh, terms of caches and finals, uh, I don't know, Leanne Barrett, if I were going to vote today, I would have to give her my vote. It definitely looks like uh, Leanne is the four, or the front runner. Mm -hmm. For the first time uh, in her career to be the Boulder of the Year, that would be quite an honor. And of course, uh, we're finishing up here in Las Vegas uh, this evening, but uh, the LPBT Tour can be seen once again in... February of 1991 on ESPN, Sunday night, February 10th, midnight for you folks on the East Coast, a comfortable 9 o'clock on the West Coast. Just two players remain, Jeannie Maiden, our top seed, and Wendy McPherson. Both these players wanting this title very badly. Now, neither of these players has won a title since 1988, so it's been a couple years of a dry spells for the both. Jeannie Maiden comes out and just dices up the rack on lane 19. An aggressive shot for Jeannie Maiden. Well, Jeannie was fortunate in each round. She started out uh, with a big game, 265 last night, 279. Uh, so she comes out with the rounds with these big games. It just boosted her. Notice a new look for Jeannie Maiden, the glasses. Uh, she said she was having problems with her right eye in Rockford and went home and Got that taken care of, and it's much better. It was affecting my bowling. And for the first time in this championship round, Wendy McPherson goes up in the opening frame, throws a great shot, and does not get a strike. A little bit more pressure on Wendy now. Jeannie comes out, opens up with a great shot. Wendy doesn't carry. She obviously likes the pair of 19 and 20. Very consistent pair for her. Cross lane, and the 10-pin topples. Wendy McPherson with a spare in the first. Spare's really not difficult this week. Uh, not too many of the players miss very many of them, especially 10 pins. They're uh, relatively easy to pick up. Three and five now on the season in the championship round after going 0 for 5. And the more you win, the more comfortable you feel. Messenger 
gets caught in the process of heading to the 10 pin, so it's back-to-back -back 10 pins for Wendy McPherson. Well, that hit could have carried as well, a little softer in the pocket, swished out the five, but uh, six pin just was not able to take out the 10. Back to back, and this time she misses by a fraction. So an unforced error here in the title match. How many times do you see it happen when the pressure's really on? How many times do you see the announcers say how easy the 10 pins are to pick up, and she gets up and misses it? Missed by a whisker. But I think you're right. It's the first one that I've seen missed. Uh, watched some last night. It wasn't that difficult. To, the difference is you're bowling for the title as compared to just out there throwing them. Jeannie Maiden comes back with a super shot. Sounds like she's dropping it just a little bit, but the ball is reacting nicely. Leaves the solid 10 in the second. Now Jeannie uh, setting the ball right around the 13th board early on in the heads, and then uh, really only crossing out to about the ninth board. Now she's keeping up her ball speed. She's uh, well over 17 miles an hour. Played them in most of the week, anywhere from 10 to 15 across the house. Very, uh, very much uh, a comfortable player from that inside line. And uh, both of those balls sounded as if she dropped them. I know one thing. She better get a couple of pieces of tape out, which is, I think, what she's doing right at this moment. Jeannie's gain, the five-step approach. Now, she has changed from four to five occasionally. Very high push away, straight pendulum swing, the high back swing. Her head is very still throughout her whole approach. Long extension, left shoulder very far back as she uh, reaches through the ball. Trying to calm down just a little bit. Uh, key match for Jeannie Maiden, I would say. Maybe a key stage in her career. It hasn't been a great year for her. She'd love to finish off with a win. Jeannie did add a piece of tape during the crossover, and it still sounded as if she dropped it a little bit. But... Not as bad. You can see her face. She seemed to relax a little bit as she came back. She's like, okay, put the tape in. That felt better. Threw a nice strike. All right, let's go on to the fourth frame. I'd like to drop the ball and uh, <laughs> yeah. go strike ringing 10 strike. Huh? <laughs> drop it in there and average 229 for the week, right? <sighs> Wendy McPherson has just continued to climb the ladder of success here in Las Vegas, but now that she's in the title match, she needs to settle down just a little bit. Fortunate there to, to leave just the six pin. Is that one right through the nose? Really tightening up uh, her line that time. Did not trust it out to the right. Also, the lanes could be breaking down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, she's been on them now for three games, and uh, she may have to make some subtle adjustments. after you open up uh, once again you get a little bit tighter and your things are running through your mind like oh great uh, just uh, gave her a big break or uh, you know I could blow this now don't blow it <laughs> mm -hmm. Jeannie all she's thinking about is just give me a chance to double in the fourth get ahead in this thing Light hit to eight left, and Wendy McPherson, who averaged nearly eight strikes per game the first three games, is having trouble hitting the pocket. Much deeper there as uh, she did move in on lane 19, hit about the 16th, 17th board early on, and uh, ball only made it out to about the 11th board. Not easy shooting at the double wood. Two eight disappears. In the fourth frame for Wendy McPherson. Jeannie Maiden leads by 14. Could extend that to 24 if she strikes here in the fourth. Jeannie Maiden, Maiden in 1988 was inducted into the Cleveland Hall of Fame. So she has done a lot of wonderful things in the wonderful state of Ohio and city of Cleveland. She set a WIBC record in their city tournament. Shot 864 for three games, and that is a lot of strikes. Another good shot, another solid 10 on lane 20. Ouch. Well, I mentioned to you, Denny, I couldn't figure out how to get the 10 out, so... Uh... Yeah, she strikes in the second and the fourth. It's off to the races. I got a four-bagger. Adios. I'll see you later. Great shot. Yeah. Jeannie Maiden, one of the players, shot 299 this week. Left a solid four pin on her last ball. Stretches out, cross lane, and the 10 pin. 
makes an exit stage right. Still a 14-pin lead as Wendy McPherson now. A little doctoring of the thumb hole as uh, the thumb looks like it might be swelling up a little bit, huh? She's taking tape out. Exactly. It's a little warm underneath the lights. Your hands have a tendency to swell. Also, uh, when you miss, my hands usually go up. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking... Looking for an excuse, or does your body change that dramatically? It really does. Sure when your does. Uh, heart starts uh, beating a little faster, the blood starts flowing <laughs> a little bit more, and yeah. the hands start to swell. Plus, there's $20,000 on top, anyhow. Uh, well, 2-5. These players right now uh, jockeying for position here, I think, to make the run in the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Last couple, three weeks, we've had some strange title matches, though. We've had some matches decided in the 8th frame. I don't think that'll happen here this evening. Jeannie adding another piece of tape. It almost did sound like she was still dropping it, but I think she's afraid to put too much tape in that she may hang up in it. Set that one down very, very short. So instead of leading by 12, now it's a one-pin lead for Jeannie Maiden after the miss. Catching the lane conditioner in the center of the lane, this ball just stays in a dead slide never picks up into a roll. Now watch this shot for Wendy McPherson on lane 20. Never fails out here on the national tour when you get a chance to jump on them with both feet. They usually do. Wendy says, hey, if you're going to let me in, I'm coming through that door. She just crunched this shot. You can see the bowler track system right here at work. 15th board at uh, 15 feet, right around the 11th board, staying pretty tight. Not that big belly that we saw in the first game, so the lanes could have been tightening up a little bit as we saw the conditioner carry down. Major break of the week. Wendy McPherson with a little Yankee Doodle Dandy crosses over, carries the 6 and the 10, and that's a backbreaker if you're Jeannie Maiden. Watch the head pin as it goes against the wall, comes right between the 6 and the 10, and they split. Wendy says, fine. You know, I left a 10-pin uh, earlier. Jeannie Maiden, who has left ringing 10s, both shots on lane 20, is saying, let me hit the pocket one more time and get a strike. Leaves the bucket and one, and you can see the momentum has swung major league in that lady's favor right there. Jeannie actually getting that ball out too far to the right hit around the eighth board and uh, was unable to make it back. Also didn't look as if she really got the lift that time. Sigh of relief, a shake of the head, adjust the glasses, and let's move on to the next frame. A very difficult spare as uh, any time you leave the five count bucket. Well, instead of the lead, now she trails, and Wendy McPherson ponders her future. Will she be lucky enough to win the 20000 That was the first good, clean release that I've seen Jeannie come up with, and another solid 10-pin. And she has to be saying to herself, when am I going to get some kind of a break? Really great shots, Denny. There's really nothing more that she could do other than uh, to carry. That six pin just rings around the 10. Like I said, I, I really couldn't uh, figure out figure it out myself. Here she's uh, playing around the 13th board, not real deep, right around the 11th, 10th, 10th, 11th board at her break point. Just trying to hang in right now and play the cards that she's been dealt. Three solid 10 pins for Jeannie Maiden and Wendy McPherson leads by 10 after the Brooklyn strike. She heads back to lane 20.
Well, I thought this 10-pin was definitely uh, down. Is it still rocking? We're either having a tremor here in Las Vegas or that thing is still moving around. What a tough break for Wendy McPherson, who this time picks up the 10 as she uh, does a little tightrope act. Well, she missed it uh, to the left, so she was definitely going to throw it a little farther to the right. And uh, she now has the lead by nine pins. Mm, mm, mm. That thing was about uh, a third of the way over. Jeannie's just trying to figure out what she can do to try to carry. You can't really make any adjustments off those solid tens. No way. No you got to say to yourself, I got to, I hope I throw it that good the next three or four shots. You bet. Oh. I mean, flat tens, you can make the adjustment. Sure. But ringing tens, it's just very difficult. That's when you need one of those tear-apart dolls. You see those things? <laughs> <laughs> Order me one for floor. Christmas, yeah, will you? <laughs> Slam that thing on the floor, tear off an arm or a leg. Eh? Key shot. The shot of the week for Jeannie Maiden. Good speed, and instead of hitting flush, she goes with the light shot and gets an X. I told you those light hits carry uh, better here throughout the week. A lot of wall shots. Interesting note right now, if Jeannie Maiden strikes, she goes back on top for the first time in ages and puts the pressure back on Wendy McPherson. Good news for Wendy, she gets to finish first. Gotta have it. Oh my goodness. Save the best for last. Perfect shot for Jeannie Maiden who doubles up in the eighth of the night. Appeared that she went a little bit more direct, did not cross quite as many boards. It can only be just about a one board difference that makes it to carry that 10. And Jeannie Maiden showing the emotion here. She was determined. Well, Wendy McPherson, if she strikes out, can just win the title outright. She knows it, and she throws a perfect shot on lane 20. Well, they're gearing up and performing when the pressure is at its utmost. Can't get too much closer, too much better of a match than we're having right now. Winnie McPherson can shoot 225. Jeannie Main can shoot 216. couple more strikes and it's all over. Got to get them one at a time. And it's not to be for Wendy McPherson. So now, can't get down too low. You got to pick up the 2-5 and fill the best you possibly can. And what every player hopes for, an opportunity to go up and win your own tournament in the 10th frame. Jeannie May knew that Wendy could get up and just close her right out. And like you said, that's exactly what she was hoping for. I think that's got to be the toughest thing for a top seed to, to get closed out before you even get a chance to go up in the 10th frame, but that will not be the story here. With a strike, it'll be a game of 2.03 for Wendy McPherson. Jeannie Main will have to get up and strike in her first shot. Yeah, but if you're going to win, that's the way to go. Cold the interesting thing will be, she's thrown those flush shots on 20 and didn't strike. Then she throws the light when it gets the X. Beautiful performance by Wendy McPherson. But right now, the lady in red is in control of her own destiny. One strike for the title, through the nose, oh my! Oh my goodness, Jeannie Maiden gets the break of a lifetime and Wendy McPherson watches a title pass right through her fingertips. Oh my, uh, well Jeannie says, so uh, what can I say? <laughs> I just tripped out the six, seven. I left two ringing 10 pins, three 10 pins earlier in the match. Wendy carries the Brooklyn. I just got the break of a lifetime. Now she needs nine. Yeah. 
Easier to get that. And she leaves the bucket. She needed eight. Well, we're talking about two shots. On her, well, on her first ball, Wendy McPherson is the winner. If she, yep. Wow. Jeannie needed seven and a spare to tie. Oh, my goodness. What a way to finish it up by one pin heartbreak. As Wendy McPherson comes away a winner, and you have to say that fate played a major role in this one. Wendy McPherson wins the 20,000 and the Samstown Invitational. And it was definitely... I started the week off really well, and then I struggled a little bit. Last night, I pulled it out the last few games, and I guess it was just meant to be because I got every break in the world today. All right, you've already got the jacket. Bruce Frazier now has the trophy. Uh, Wendy, on behalf of Samstown, here's your trophy for the mantle for the Samstown Invitational. Congratulations. Thank you, Bruce. I'd like to thank Bruce and everyone here at Samstown for a wonderful week. What more can I say? All right, and Bob quickly with a $20,000 check for Wendy. Wendy, McCurse. congratulations. I think that was one of the most exciting finals we've ever had here. I want to congratulate you. And on behalf of Samstown and the LPBT, there's a check for $20,000. That's the important thing. We'd be glad to cash it for you right upstairs. Congratulations.